In this video, we're going to be talking about mineral properties. Now, mineral properties are visual and material properties that are usually measured in a lab. And they're used to distinguish one mineral from another. So what you're going to want to know is you're going to want to know how the tests are used and some of the common minerals that you can identify based on these properties. So the first property we're going to look at is cleavage. This is actually one of the most care distinguishing characteristics for some minerals. So cleavage is a, when a mineral breaks along a distinct planar surface. So for instance, here is a picture of the mineral calcite. All right, now if we look here, this is actually what the structure of calcite looks like, calcite CaCO3. And so in the picture, you can see these, um, the white is the calcium and the black is carbon and the three little red ones are oxygen. All right, now if we look at the mineral in the left, you can see that kind of rhombus shape to the crystal. Let's see if I take that away. Now if we look over here in the model, you can see that exact same rhombus shape. So it's going to break along these rhombohedral shapes because that's how the atoms are bonded together. And so we talked about mineral bonds in one of the previous videos and how important they are, and this is when those come back into play. All right, here's another example. You have halite, nice plain old table salt. And if we look, here is a structure of halite where you have sodium and chlorine bonded together. And those halites are going to be growing in beautiful cubes. They also break into cubes. So if you were to look at your table salt, whenever you have a chance and you've got a salt shaker in front of you, you should do this. Look at the pieces of salt in the salt shaker. They're going to be little bitty cubes. And that's because the structure is cubic as well. And you can see every time you break a bond, it's going to break along those same right angles. Now when we describe cleavage, we describe it in terms of planes of cleavage. And this is how many um, parallel surfaces you have. All right, so I'm going to show you some examples of what these look like. So there's minerals with one plane of cleavage. So that means it's always going to break along one parallel parallel surface. Um, so really common minerals you're going to see with this one plane of cleavage are biotite and muscovite. These are known as micas. And that's what you see in the picture on the right. They peel off into really thin little sheets. Another mineral that has one plane of cleavage that isn't quite so thin is gypsum. That's the picture down on the left. It has one plane of cleavage as well. Now when it has two planes of cleavage, you're going to have two flat sides that repeat over and over again. So the picture on the left is a feldspar. And you can see that blocky shape to it, that lovely right angle where it meets. On the right is an amphibole, um, and it actually has about 120 degree cleavage. So it has two planes of cleavage, but they don't meet at right angles. And what's kind of cool is if we look at this, so this is what it looks like under a microscope in a thin section. So a thin section is when you take a rock and you slice it really thin to like, it's about the width of a hair is how thin you, you actually slice it down. And it's on a glued on a microscope slide and you're able to put it under a microscope and actually see through it. And when you do that, you can see these beautiful cleavage angles um, where it's breaking in that crystal. So this is an amphibole under the microscope. Three planes of cleavage um, tend to give you really interesting looking minerals. Now these look like almost like stair steps a lot of times. So you can have 90 degree cleavage, which gives you beautiful cubic cleavage, like the halite that you see here on the left, or one of my favorites, galena. Um, this is a lead sulfide mineral. So galena tends is has cubic cleavage as well, or just like we saw the calcite earlier, it looks kind of like a cube that's been like squished over, and this is called rhombohedral cleavage. Now then it gets kind of wacky because you get more and more. So a fluorite and diamond, fluorites are on the left and the diamond is on the right. These actually have four planes of cleavage and it ends up making octahedrons. And then a sphalerite has dodecahedron cleavage, and this means there's six planes of cleavage. Um, so a dodecahedron is 12-sided, um, 
and that's how you tend to see the crystals there. Now cleavage is kind of interesting because this is one of the things that they take advantage of when they're making gemstones. So gemstones have facets, right? Those are the flat sides that make it look all sparkly. So if you understand the cleavage of a mineral, you can actually facet it along those cleavage planes um, and make that gemstone extra, extra sparkly. Now not everything has cleavage. Some minerals don't bring along, break along those nice parallel sides. And one of the big minerals you're going to see over and over and over that doesn't have cleavage is called quartz. Now, you've probably heard of quartz before. We talked about it before. Now quartz, when it breaks though, we say it has a conchoidal fracture. So a fracture is when it breaks unevenly. Um, and in the case of quartz, if you look, this probably bears a striking resemblance to another material, right? Yeah, it looks like glass. And that's because quartz is basically what makes glass up. Um, and so that beautiful conchoidal fracture we actually see in glass and in quartz crystals. Now if we take a step back and we're going to see what about, we're going to look at some light properties. So luster is the way a mineral surface scatters light. All right, so it's the way the light bounces off the surface. So there's two big broad categories. One of them is called metallic. And down here in the middle, you have a pyrite. This is a lovely metallic example of luster. It looks like a metal. They're shiny, they're opaque. It pretty much, it's, it looks like a metal is the easiest way to describe it. Or you have non-metallics, in which case they can be shiny, but a lot of times they're not opaque and they don't have that metal look to them. Now, out of the non-metallic lusters, we've, there's other ones too, so I thought I'd show you a few of those. On the left, this is a, well, this gemstone is called Tiger's Eye. Um, it's actually really closely related to asbestos, but it's said to have a satiny luster, and if you look at it in the light, it kind of lights up sort of like satin does. Or in the middle, you have quartz, and quartz, in this case, has an adamantine luster. That just means it's really, really shiny, and a lot of the minerals that are used for gemstones or that look really cool on display have an adamantine luster because they're really shiny. On the top right is the mineral talc, and it's said to have a pearly luster. So it's that really soft, kind of barely translucent look to the side that you would see in pearls. Right below it, this is a mineral called kaolinite, and it's said to have a dull luster. Um, not very shiny. It's just, that's the way they look. And then over here on the left, this is gertite, and it has an earthy luster. It means it looks sort of like dirt, which is sort of the, uh, the lamest one out of all of them, right? All right, so this is how it bounces off the surface. We can also look at how it passes through a mineral. So if a mineral is transparent, you can actually see all the way through it. Here's a lovely example of a window. So normal window panes have tran are transparent. That's why you can see through it. This is actually from a house on Camelback Mountain. Um, so your example is on the right. This is a mineral calcite. And so you can see right through the calcite. We're going to talk a little bit about why this picture is particularly cool at the end of this thing. If it's translucent, some light passes through, but not all of it. So you can't, you can see light through it, but you can't see what's on the other side of it. So in terms of windows, this is like your frosted glass. So frosted glass is translucent. So you can sort of see the outline of the hand, but you can't really make out details. And on the right, this is a big massive piece of rose quartz, that nice kind of pretty soft pink color. Or you can have an opaque mineral, like this door here. I always heard, you ever get told you make a better door than you do a window? It's usually when you're standing between the person and the TV, right? So if it's opaque, you can't see through it at all. So a beautiful example of that is this malachite sample on the right. This is a copper bearing mineral. We have lots of it here in Arizona. Um, but it's well known for that, that beautiful dark green color. Now, while I'm talking about color, that's another property, although it's kind of a poor one to use for identification. So it's terrible to use for mineral identification. All right, there's a couple reasons why. So I'm gonna show you some examples of minerals. All right, in this case, this one's green and this one's almost black and that one's colorless. Colorless is a color. You've got a pink one, you've got orange, you've got white, you've got purple. 
These are all the same mineral. These are all quartz. The green one is because it has a mineral called chlorite mixed into it. The smoky quartz is this color because it's been exposed to radiation. The colorless quartz is sort of how we think about it. So this is a fairly pure quartz. The pink comes from a little bit of extra manganese. There's citrine. This can actually be created in a lab by heating it up. So if you buy citrine jewelry, it's probably been heated. So just a normal clear window is heated. Um, the white is a milky quartz. And the milkiness comes from bubbles inside the mineral structure. And of course you have amethyst. And that's because of impurity, sometimes because of like magnesium. On the flip side, this is colorless. All, these, all of these are colorless. So you can say, okay, quartz. Quartz is colorless. Well, it's not always colorless and it's not the only colorless mineral. So if we look through here, you have quartz, which is easy. You have calcite, you have halite, you have gypsum. And those are four major, major minerals that are super easy to recognize. You have apophyllite, you have shelite, celestite, tourmaline, and garnet. So some tourmaline and garnets usually come in a lot darker colors, but they do come in colorless every once in a while. So you can see how remembering one or two colors really does mess you up in, uh, in life. Now, halite, calcite, quartz, and gypsum, super easy to tell one from another. Gypsum's really soft. Quartz doesn't have any cleavage. Calcite. Um, has one property I'm going to show you at the end of the video that makes it super distinctive. Halite grows in cubes and it's got another property too. So we're going to look at some more of those and how you can tell the difference between these really easily. There are some colors that are fairly distinctive. If you see a mineral that's bright yellow, it's probably sulfur. There's not many minerals that color at all. If you see this really dark green color, it's probably malachite because there's not many minerals that are that dark green. Although there are a lot of copper minerals that come in various shades of green and blue green. So if color is a bad way of looking at it, um, a streak actually works a little bit better. So the streak is the color of the powdered form of the mineral. A streak is not necessarily the same color as the mineral, but some minerals have fairly diagnostic streaks. Now how this test is done is you take a, an unglazed ceramic plate. Um, they make little tiles for us to do this. You can see it comes in white and black because some minerals have really light colored streaks and it helps to see them. Um, and this gentleman in the little GIF is showing you how to do it. Although if I'm being honest, he's kind of doing a poor job of it because you actually want that streak plate down on the table. Holding it like that, if you push a little too hard, you can snap the plate and it's all sorts of dangerous. All right, so for instance, here is the mineral hematite. So it's an iron oxide. This particular one is from South Africa and it's lovely. So you can see it's a really dark color, shiny, shiny metallic. So if I were to rub that mineral onto a ceramic plate, what color do you think it would leave behind. Now if you guessed dark red, you're right. So this is kind of an oddball, right? It's got a totally different color streak than the mineral itself. Um, but if you think about it, what does this look like? If you saw that color on your car somewhere, what would you assume? Looks a lot like rust, right? Fe203, that is rust. Hematite is basically chemically rust, and it forms when iron-bearing minerals oxidize. Um, it sometimes just takes powdering it to be able to see that rust color, though. Let's look at one more. Pyrite, fool's gold, lovely, beautiful golden color. It streaks black, a really dark gray. Now, there's a lot of minerals that look kind of like pyrite. There's calcopyrite, there's marcasite. Each one of those has a little bit different streak and it makes it easy to tell those apart from one another. Um, it also helps you distinguish it from real gold because real gold actually streaks gold color. All right, we talked about how minerals break. Let's look at how minerals grow. So this is called the habit. So the habit is the common characteristic shape of a crystal or an aggregate of crystals. That just means a big clump of them together. All right, so this is how the mineral grows. 
I'll show you some examples. Um, a zircon here, this is called equant, which means it's, it's about equal in size all the way around. Bladed, this is a kyanite, it looks like knife blades. Um, kyanite's really pretty. It could be fibrous. So this is okinite, and this is one of the more common ones you see when we talk about a fibrous habit. Um, now, this may look like a tribble, but don't let that fool you. If you were to touch that, those are like shards of glass. And for those of you who are not giant nerds, um, tribbles were these little fuzzy critters back at the old school Star Trek days. Tabular it tends to be wider than it is tall, so it's like a, a tablet, like a pill, if you take a pill, pill tablet, right? So this is corundum. When corundum is pink, we call it a um, a ruby. This one is not gym quality, but it is that pink color, which is kind of cool. Now prismatic is what they make big prism crystals, and quartz is really well known for this. And if you think about some of the, the popular collecting minerals that you, you collect and have sit around, these tend to be prismatic because um, they're purdy. Platied. Now here's hematite again. You'll see hematite a few times today because I like it. Um, this platy mineral, it grows in like these really thin plates, which is kind of cool. Blocky minerals grow in kind of big, big brick shapes. And this is orthoclase or potassium feldspar. This color um, I pointed out earlier in another video because this is pretty common in granites. And this kind of characteristic peachy pink color can be recognizable for you too. One of my favorites is botryoidal or botryoidal. Um, and in this case, it's big, it grows in like big mounds. So that's a botryoidal hematite on the left. On the right is a botryoidal malachite that's been cut into. And if I zoom back here a few slides, there you go. Here's a, here's what that malachite sort of looks like from the outside. But when you slice into it and polish it really nice, you get these lovely circles in here, which makes it a really popular lapidary stone. Now, there are some minerals that have two or more common habits. For instance, hematite grows in a number of different forms. Uh, I showed you the botryoidal and the platy. Those are the same mineral. And the structure, the chemical structure, looks exactly the same. So the bonds between the atoms look exactly the same. They're just arranged a little bit differently there. Calcite actually comes in lots of different shapes. The one you're going to see most often, at least for us, is going to be this rhombus shape we've already seen. Um, but all the other ones count too. Uh, this one below it, this is called dog tooth calcite because it looks sort of like a tooth and that's another fairly common one. All right, so we keep moving on here. We're going to look at hardness. So hardness is, is sort of interesting. So rather than like how hard and tough it is like against breaking, hardness is a relative ability to resist scratching, right? So if you're going to test the hardness, you take one mineral and rub it on another, and if it scratches like you see happening in this GIF here, you can see that scratch left behind. So the mineral in the right hand is harder than the mineral in the left hand. Now these are based on the Mohs scale of hardness. Um, this was actually done in 1812 by a German mineralogist named Frederick Mohs. And he just took some common minerals and did this. He scratched one at each other with them and then put them in order from what was hardest to what was softest. So if we look at those, the hardest out of all of them is a diamond. So that has a hardness of 10. They scratch just about everything and this is why we use it to polish and to cut stuff. Um, diamond blades will cut through almost anything. You also have corundum. We saw that ruby earlier. An eight is topaz. This is the November birthstone, if you're keeping up with these. Seven is quartz, and that's about the hardness of glass. So sometimes in a, in a lab setting, we use glass plates to see if, and it's hard, if it's hard, if the mineral scratches glass, it's harder than this. There's that orthoglaze, that potassium feldspar again. And five is apatite. Interestingly enough, it has the same hardness as your tooth enamel. A four is a fluorite. It's pretty purple crystals. It comes in lots of different colors. A three is calcite. We're getting really soft now. 
A 2 is gypsum. Now your fingernail is actually about a 2.5. And you can see all the scratches on the surface of that gypsum crystal. You should be able to scratch gypsum with your fingernail. Just pick it up and scratch it. And number one, the very softest, is talc. All right, so it's always good to know a couple of these, especially those extreme outliers with, with diamond being the hardest and talc being the softest. But keep that gypsum one in mind too because it makes it super easy to ID. There is a fun question. Do you like gemstones? If you think of the really common gemstones, corundum, the mineral, just makes rubies and sapphires depending on what color it is. Olivine makes peridot. Beryl is aquamine and emerald. We use diamonds, we use topaz, we use quartz, or the mineral tourmaline. That's a really popular one. This is a tourmaline here on the left. What do these all have in common? They're all some of the hardest minerals on the hardness scale. But it sort of makes sense, right? Because if you had a mineral that was soft that you wore as jewelry, it would end up looking a lot like this gypsum down here and it would scratch really easily. So our gemstones tend to be those really hard minerals just because they're a lot more durable that way. Um, they are still kind of brittle, so if you drop a diamond, it'll still break. You just don't scratch it very much. All right, we're gonna look at some other properties that um, maybe just a few distinctive minerals have. So one of these extra properties is called specific gravity. So this represents the density of a material. So sort of how heavy it feels for its size. All right, so if it feels really heavy, but it's very pretty soft or pretty small, we say it has a high specific gravity. So this is based on the chemical composition. For instance, this is the mineral galena. If you notice, galena is a lead sulfide because it has lead in it it's gonna feel really, really heavy. Another mineral that tends to be really heavy is barite as well, so you can keep an eye out for that one. Some minerals have really distinctive tastes. So if you lick it, it's gonna taste um, really distinctive, and halite's the one everybody knows. So halite, um, there's a picture. I think I mentioned those cubes in your salt shaker earlier. That's what they look like as nice little cubes. It tastes salty, and if you lick a halite rock, it tastes salty. Now, there's lots of other types of salt minerals. That's just uh, kind of held together by ionic bonds is basically what a salt is. Um, and they all taste salty, but it's like different flavors of salt, as weird as that sounds. Now, some minerals have a, a particular feel to them. It's a tactile kind of thing. So, talc tends to feel really soft and slippery. And when you grind talc up, it makes talcum powder. And if you think of the way talcum powder feels, um, that's what talc feels like, which is pretty cool. Now, some minerals have a distinctive smell. And sulfur is one I think everybody's sort of familiar with, is that, that kind of fresh sulfur elemental smell to it. But sulfur compounds tend to have their own distinctive smell. And so minerals that have those sulfur compounds, it will we'll tend to smell pretty bad too. There are some minerals that actually have are magnetic and they align with the magnetic field. Uh, it's mostly due to the presence of iron in the mineral structure. So the mineral magnetite is one of the most common examples here. So here's a big chunk of magnetite and you can see all the tools that are stuck to it. Um, on the left is a picture of what smaller crystals look like, but you could slap a magnet onto the side of these things, which is pretty cool. Now here's a really cool optical property, and it's all about how the light flows through the mineral. So this is called double refraction, and it happens when the light rays are actually split into two separate rays. And so what happens is you can see in the background there's one line drawn on, but when you put the crystal over it, it looks like there's two. And if you were to rotate this crystal, it actually moves around, which is cool. I should be showing you that in class so you can get to see what that really looks like. Now this is the only thing that calcite does. Calcite also has this really cool property. So calcite has this other really cool property. Um, so if you take some hydrochloric acid, so one molar HCl, and you drip it onto the calcite crystal, 
There it goes. You can see it starts to bubble and fizz. So we say this reacts with that hydrochloric acid. Um, calcite is the one mineral that does this super easily, super vigorously, at least for you in lab. So it makes it super easy to tell what it is. Other minerals that are going to be easy to find, figure out too, are dolomite. So dolomite doesn't react vigorously like this, but if you were to take your steel nail and scratch the top of the dolomite where it has lots of little powder, and then put the acid on it, that powder will actually um, fizz pretty quickly. Now since calcite does this, that means that minerals that have calcite in it will also, or other rocks that have calcite in it will also do it. So limestone and marble, um, that's a sedimentary and a metamorphic rock. They both react with acid too because of this. All right, so that's a quick introduction for you and hopefully it gives you an idea of how we tell one mineral from another.